Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the OIC's uh, uh, Options Education Council webinar series. Um, it certainly has been a, a crazy last several months. Um, last year, uh, for example, for uh, most of us, things have been a little bit uh, different, a little bit unusual, but what is uh, consistent in this time that we find ourselves is the need for education, certainly for financial education with the markets being as they uh, have been recently. So uh, I certainly am glad that all of you are joining us today to discuss the foundations of options pricing. Before we get into it, a little housekeeping that we have to do, our standard disclaimer, uh, and it's something that we usually gloss over uh, fairly quickly, but I do want to take just a minute to uh, explore this with some of you because of the fact that we've got so many beginners that, uh, you know, part of their New Year's resolution maybe is to take a more active stake in their financial future. Uh, and as is uh, evidenced by the recent volume that we see in the markets, there's a lot of uh, beginners that are uh, now investing with options. So I uh, certainly want everybody to know that options involve risks and may not be suitable for everybody. As a matter of fact, before you open uh, a, a, an options trading account, your broker will uh, require you to be approved for options trading. Part of that approval process uh, comes in the receipt and understanding of the characteristics and risks of standardized options booklet, what we call the Options Disclosure Document, or the ODD. You can get a free copy of it uh, to download on our website, or you can simply contact your broker. Um, we're not going to be doing too many calculations or examples with this presentation on options pricing. It's really going to be more from a conceptual standpoint. Um, but the strategies that we discuss, and even the concepts that we discuss, are simply uh, used for illustrative and educational purposes. Uh, we're not here to induce or um, to endorse any particular uh, option trade. We're not making any stock recommendations, things like that. So um, OIC is all about education, and that is what we aim to provide for you today. Speaking of OIC, we do provide that uh, options education to you uh, from our website. Uh, uh, optionseducation.org. We've got online courses, podcasts, videos, etc. And then the pride of OIC and OCC is our investor education team. We have Ed and Ken behind the scenes today answering your questions in real time. We'll also be answering those questions uh, in a Q&A session a little bit later. OIC is the educational arm of the OCC. Uh, and the OCC is the clearinghouse that acts as the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer, facilitates the exercise and assignment process uh, in terms of settlement, and really makes sure that the terms of your option contract get fulfilled. And as I had mentioned, education is our key. Uh, it, it's our focus, which, you know, in these times, uh, it is really um, is completely necessary. Uh, you can take a look here, uh, our options volume. You can see that in 2020 we had a record year. We blew the doors off uh, of previous years in terms of options volume, just about to under 7.5 billion option contracts traded hands in 2020. And 2021 is shaping up to be a very busy year as well. Uh, I believe the end of January, uh, the OCC cleared just uh, a little bit under 850 million option contracts. Uh, we had a record day of 60 million options uh, that exchanged hands in one day, certainly a record in the 50-plus uh, years, or the almost 50 years, I should say, that the uh, industry has been around. Um, and we've also seen a record number of newcomers to the market, uh, of beginners, to financing and, uh, and certainly to options. And, and again, that's why that uh, education provided by OIC as well as by uh, your broker is, is so uh, important. Uh, at the investor services desk, we get uh, phone calls, emails, and chats all day long with, from beginning investors wanting to know uh, how their option contract is going to behave, want to know what the effect of a reverse split or a trading halt or a bankruptcy has on their option contracts. Uh, and, and that's where we come in. We provide that education. So if you do have 
and options related questions, certainly feel free to uh, drop it in that uh, Q&A box in the lower, uh, I believe, left-hand corner of your screen. Ken and Ed will be uh, answering those, or feel free to reach out to us at uh, the Investor Services Desk. You can reach us at options at the OCC.com. So let's uh, go ahead and get into the, uh, the meat and potatoes of our presentation. We're going to be talking about option basics, uh, the pricing basics in terms of uh, supply and demand. We're going to look at a couple different of the more popular option pricing models, what they are, why people use them. And then we're going to finish up with some terminology. What does it mean to be in, at, or out of the money? How is that determined? And what is the concept of intrinsic and extrinsic value? So let's go ahead and uh, get right started with our options basics. The two questions that we receive uh, most here at the Investor Services Desk is, uh, and certainly from beginners, is who makes option prices and, and what is an option worth? Well, the who makes option prices is a little bit easier to understand. Um, all market participants, uh, all institutional traders, um, individual investors, professional market makers, anybody who provides a bid, which is a uh, proposal to purchase or who provides an offer to sell, those are all uh, the market participants that go into determining what price uh, those options are going to trade at. You could have a big bank who's looking to buy 50,000 uh, call options, for example, but if you as an individual investor, if you're willing to pay just a penny more, even if it's only on one contract, the market as a whole is going to see your order first. There's something called the national best bid, best offer. That's a consensus of the absolute best price at which uh, buyers are willing to pay or the best price at which sellers are willing to offer. And those national best bid, best offer, the NBBO as we call it, uh, that NBBO is going to be disseminated on trading screens around the world. So who makes option prices? Everybody who's got the um, skin in the game, so to speak, all of the buyers and sellers. But knowing that, uh, what is the option going to be worth? This is a little bit more difficult. The, something that I like to say is no matter if we're talking options, if you're talking stock, or if you're talking, uh, you know, apples or oranges, um, the worth of any good and service depends on what somebody's willing to pay. You can only buy an option at a price at which somebody's willing to sell it. You can only sell an option at a price uh, at which somebody is willing to buy. You can certainly use pricing models, which we'll discuss shortly. Pricing models are, uh, are simply uh, mechanisms or formulas where you put in a, uh, a specific set of inputs and it gives you an output of an option price. And it's a, it's a good guideline to begin that uh, negotiation process of buying or selling options. But it's just that. It's a guideline. If the pricing model tells you the option is, is worth $3, but in the market it's trading $3.20, then that option, uh, that pricing model may not be uh, as useful as uh, one would hope. Really what it is, it's, it's simply based on the economic principles of supply and demand. Uh, in, in, I'm going to visit that in a little bit more in depth than we normally would. Certainly the elephant in the room, if you will, is the recent uh, frenzy over certain uh, stocks that were discussed online on, on certain uh, trading forums. Um, and the demand for those stocks um, was stratospheric. Uh, and part of the reason why we're seeing so much trading today is because of uh, that demand in, in just the market in general, but certainly these specific stocks. So when it comes to supply and demand, those can override any of our pricing models. When we have supply and demand, if you have a low supply of something, in the case here we've got a single bushel of uh, or a barrel of apples um, selling for a dollar each, and we've got a high demand. We've got a group of a little over half a dozen people that, that are looking to buy that uh, that good or service, in this case uh, apples, 
they're looking to buy those. So if you've got a lot of people that want to buy something, that's going to raise the prices up. If you have a low supply of something to sell, uh, that's going to raise prices up as well. So high demand and or low supply is going to increase uh, prices, whether it be stock prices, option prices, or price of apples. If you have a high supply or a low demand or a combination of the two, that's going to decrease apples. If I'm a, an apple seller and I've got 10 apples to sell, you know, maybe I'll try to sell them for a dollar a piece. But if I've got a thousand apples to sell, uh, obviously, those apples aren't going to last forever, so I'm going to need to get rid of them as quickly as I can uh, in order not to lose my investment. So that's going to drop prices. Or conversely, if there aren't a lot of people that want to buy my apples, I'm going to have to lower my price in order to entice them to purchase. Uh, and when it comes to supply and demand, really more from the demand uh, perspective, that's what we've been seeing in the market, especially with some of these um, Stocks that uh, you know have been trading in the in the mid teens and went up to you know about five hundred dollars or so that there was this demand created for these securities and for these options as a way to leverage uh, the uh, increased demand and and when demand increases it does a couple things first of all uh, there's a concept uh, called implied volatility which uh, we're not going to discuss too much uh, in this session. Um, I know that uh, Ken, next month, when he discusses the Greeks, uh, we're going to be talking about implied volatility a little bit more. But implied volatility is basically the future forecast for the stock as evidenced by the current price of the option. And I know that's a, a, a lot to take in. Uh, certainly at this stage of the game if you're a beginner. So you can you know, kind of put that in the back of your mind right now and, and maybe you know, take a look at our website for some of the resources that we have about implied volatility. But the point being is that implied volatility affects option prices directly. If implied volatility increases, option prices increase. If implied volatility decreases, option prices decrease. And when demand increases, uh, certainly when it comes to options, when demand increases and when demand spikes, like we've seen recently with some of these stocks, I know one of the uh, securities that's been on everybody's lips for the last couple of weeks, implied volatility, um, you know, increased uh, up to a, a thousand percent. Uh, it was just a, a significant spike that we had seen. And because of that, option prices similarly increased significantly as well. Uh, so demand for a good or service, in this case options, when there's high demand, that's going to push those option prices uh, significantly higher. But barring supply and demand, if, if it's just at, you know, say, typical normal levels, barring some, uh, a trend that people are trying to capitalize on, or if there's a supply shortage, uh, um, you know, maybe longer term options might have a lower supply of sellers than uh, shorter term. Typically, when it comes to option trading, the, the bulk of the volume is seen around what we call the at-the-money strike, which we'll get into a little bit towards the end of the, uh, of the event. Uh, the at-the-money strike is simply the strike prices that are nearest to the current stock price. So the bulk of trading that we see is around the at-the-money level, but it's also in the short term, uh, meaning 15 to, say, 30 days uh, until expiration. There are longer-term options, what we call leaps. Um, those leaps are generally for options a year or more until expiration, and they could you know, certainly be a terrific product in a, in a number of strategies. Uh, but because the risk that sellers would assume by selling an option a year out or two years out or more, obviously, uh, it's hard to predict where stock prices are going to be two years down the road, um, and therefore option sellers are going to demand a higher premium for that greater amount of risk that they have when selling long-term options than they would short-term options. So short-term options are going to be a little bit cheaper. There's certainly going to be more volume around those short-term options and definitely the at-the-money strike. And what that may mean to you as the investor is it may result in what we call a tighter bid-ask spread. 
Uh, again, the bid is a price at which the market is willing to pay. The ask is the price at which uh, the market is willing to offer or to sell. And if you have a bid ask spread that is, say, a penny wide, a uh, dollar ten bid at a dollar eleven ask, that's a very very tight market, right? It can't get tighter than that. Um, and, and at that point, you know, price discovery or pricing models. Um, you know, are fairly uh, irrelevant. You, you don't really have a lot of choices uh, at which to buy or sell. Certainly, you could put in a bid below the market or an offer above. Uh, but the point of this is, is that longer-term options, because of that increased risk to sellers, will generally command a significantly higher price and also have wider bid-ask markets. You may have a, a market of, you know, a dollar bid at $2, so it's a dollar wide, something like that. So just something to, uh, to keep in mind. But when it comes to pricing, a lot of uh, investors use some form of pricing model. A pricing model is simply this mathematical formula that can be a useful tool in establishing the pricing uh, of your option and establishing that plan. Um, it's important to keep in mind that models don't make your decisions for you and that they uh, are subject to many unforeseen variables. We're going to get into just a second what these inputs are. Um, but in addition to these inputs, there is that unpredictable factor of supply and demand. With a lot of this stock, uh, the stock issues recently that have gone, uh, you know, really parabolic, these um, pricing models have, have gone out the window because it's, it's completely being driven, in this case, by demand. So with some of these uh, pricing models, these are the inputs. We've got stock price, strike price, volatility, uh, time until expiration, and the cost of money, what we refer to as the cost of money uh, or cost of carry, and really what it is, it's the prevailing interest rate minus any dividend. So the idea is that um, if, if you look at it from a, or if you want to visualize, say, a, a meat grinder, and you throw all of these inputs into the meat grinder, and what it spits out is uh, theoretical values for call and put prices. Now, back in 1973, there was a team of MIT uh, mathematicians, um, what we call, uh, or their, their names were uh, Black Scholes, Myron um, Scholes, and uh, unfortunately, you know, and I can't remember their, their first names out, but the, the Black Scholes model was revolutionary uh, because it was the first way that using math, option traders could determine um, the value of an option. It was, it was a very complex formula, and I'll put that up here on the board for you for anybody uh, who fancies themselves a mathematician. But what the formula did is it allowed investors to determine whether or not the option premium that they were paying or the option premium that they were collecting could be considered fair based on those inputs that we just discussed. Now, the problem with Black-Scholes is that it had some limitations. It was initially established for European-style options only. What I mean by that is there are two different option styles. There's European style, which can only be exercised at time of expiration. Then there's the American style expiry, which can be exercised at any time. So, for example, um, equities and ETFs are typically uh, American style. As a matter of fact, I think almost all of them are American style, whereas some of the cash settled index, such as the SPX, the NASDAQ, the Russell, what have you, those are um, European style. So those contracts can only be exercised at expiration. The limitation of Black Shoals is that it didn't take into account the possibility that somebody would exercise their contract early. One of the reasons people exercise their contract early, uh, especially call options, is the uh, effect of a dividend. The stocks pay dividends. Some stocks pay dividends on a regular basis, a quarterly basis, let's say. Um, and it, with a call option, for example, as Ed had mentioned in, in uh, our previous presentation, Option holders, option buyers, are not entitled to dividends. That's not a right granted uh, or inherent 
to option holders. Only shareholders receive dividends. However, by exercising their contract, option holders can, in fact, become shareholders. So if there's a dividend uh, imminent, you'll often see a lot of call options being exercised early prior to that ex-dividend date in order to become a shareholder and receive that dividend. So the Black-Scholes model doesn't take into account early exercise. It doesn't take into account that dividends would be paid, and it assumes that volatility is constant. Now, again, you know, referring back to these, um, uh, you know, the, these recent stocks that have, uh, you know, skyrocketed in value because of the um, extreme changes in the share price, whether it be up or down. It's evident that volatility is not constant, especially with some of these stocks. So, uh, you know, the Black-Scholes model, while it is uh, a very important uh, pricing model, it's also an imperfect one. It assumed that interest rates were constant. It, it doesn't. Uh, it didn't assume that interest rates would ever change. Uh, it didn't take into account any transaction costs or. Uh, commissions, things like that. So the Black Shoals model did have some uh, limitations to it. Since then, it has been improved upon. There are uh, variations uh, that people have created on Black Shoals. One uh, such variation is called the Cox Ross Rubenstein model that was in 1979. That's a binomial model. And, and what that means is the difference between a binomial model and Black Shoals is the Black-Scholes model would uh, give you a value of the contract come expiration, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, at expiration time, the, you know, they would estimate, based on all of these inputs, the, the value of the contract to be X amount of dollars. Well, what the binomial model does is it takes that end price at expiration and then works backwards. It says, for example, if you think the stock is going to go up or down by 10% over the next three months, well, you know, where would that stock theoretically be a month from now? Where would it be two months from now? And then where would it be three months from now? And at each step or each observation that we would say, uh, we can then determine using this binomial pricing model what the value of the option contract might be at that point. And one of the advantages is it, um, it takes into account, it assumes that the only way that somebody would exercise the contract prior to expiration um, is if they're exercising early, for example, uh, for a dividend. So the binomial model takes that into account uh, and allows us to price options during the uh, the life of the option as opposed to just looking at uh, at the endpoint. Now, the thing about the pricing models, whether it's binomial or the Black Shoals, um, is that it really takes a mathematician to figure out. They're extremely complex. Um, if you're like me and you prefer your math in numbers versus letters and symbols, uh, then you might choose, like the majority of uh, investors, to use an options calculator instead. We've got one on our website, optionseducation.org. Uh, your trading platform uh, likely has one as well. And what the options calculator simply does is you put in those inputs, some of which are automatically populated for you, on our website. Uh, you can type in an option symbol or a stock symbol, and it will automatically populate the, price, the uh, recent price of the stock. It will give you the at-the-money strike, how many days to expiration, et cetera. You can see here uh, where it's a style. I've chosen American style, so that would be a binomial calculation that it's going to use. If we chose European, then that would be the Black-Scholes model, but we can customize the inputs if we so choose to. And what it does then is it spits out, as you can see on the right, you can spit out the value of the options. In this case, uh, a $100 stock with a $100 strike, 49 days to expiration, 20% implied volatility, interest rates of about 2.1, which you know generally would be pretty high for uh, this low interest rate environment. But it gives us a call value of 
$3.06, a put value of about $2.80. What an option calculator would also do is it gives us the Greeks. Again, Ken's going to be talking about that in our next presentation. But what we do with this options calculator, what we do with these values that it spits out, you know, for example, the put is saying has a value of about $2.80. If we look to our option chain on our trading platform, maybe that put is trading $2.75. Uh, and we may look at it as an investor. Well, if we've got it worth $2.80 and it's trading $2.75, that might be a good buying opportunity for me. If I think it's worth 280 and I could buy it for 275, that's going to give me a, a nickel value. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, and then depending on what your forecast is for the stock, you know, hoping that the price of that put increases. You know, if, uh, for example, if you're bearish on the stock and think that the you know, share price is going to go down, we would then expect put prices to go up. So the idea being is that if we can buy it for 275 when we have it worth 280, that uh, you know that might be advantageous to us. So uh, option calculators are certainly a much easier way than uh, calculating the uh, Black Scholes model or a binomial pricing model longhand. And I'm sure that your trading platform has one as well. Uh, if not, certainly take a look at the one available on the OIC website. Now we're talking about the pricing of options, okay? But uh, what does all what what is the point of all of it? So, <clears throat> pardon me. When we talk about the value of a contract, the uh, and, and really the the whole purpose of options trading to begin with for many is for a buyer of the contract, they want. Uh, at expiration for the value of that contract to be more than what they paid for it. For the seller of the contract, they would like that, that contract to expire worthless uh, at best, or at least to expire with a value less than what they paid for it. And the idea being, if you're the buyer of a call, you pay a dollar for it, uh, maybe the market goes up and now that call is worth a dollar fifty. You simply turn around, sell it to close, and you pocket the 50 cents as profit, of course, minus any commissions or fees. If you're selling a contract at a dollar, maybe three weeks down the road, now it's only worth 50 cents. You sell high and you buy low in reverse, right? So you're selling the contract at a dollar, you're buying it back for 50 cents, you're pocketing uh, the difference there as profit. So the, the value of the contract is going to depend on whether or not that option is in, at, or out of the money. With a stock price of $50, we know that a call is in the money if the strike price is below the stock price. And the reason being, if we've got, say, a $45 call, and, and it doesn't matter if uh, the expiration. So here we've got, for example, Jan, Feb, and April. We've got $40 calls and $45 calls in the green. Those are in-the-money contracts because, theoretically, we could turn around, exercise the call for $40 if that's the strike or $45 if that's the strike, purchase those shares for $40 or $45 when they're trading in the market for $50. So there is an economic benefit of buying stock below the strike price, and that economic benefit um, is what we call being in the money. At the money is a little bit easier to understand because it's simply where the strike price equals the stock price. There is no economic benefit necessarily at that point, at that snapshot in time of exercising the $50 call when the stock is trading $50 in the market. Uh, a uh, call option is out of the money when the strike price is above the share price. So it doesn't make sense for us to buy stock trading $55 by exercising our call if the shares are only trading $50 in the market. Now, that doesn't mean that an out-of-the-money call doesn't have its value. It doesn't have its benefit. It may be very inexpensive for us to buy that, 50, that $55 call, let's say, um, versus it might be very expensive to buy the $40 call. Uh, and that's something that we'll get into a little bit uh, in just a moment with intrinsic and extrinsic value. But uh, the thing that we want to remember here is when it comes to calls, 
a uh, option is in the money if the strike price is below the stock. It's at the money when the two are equal, and it's out of the money when the strike price is above the share price. Puts are going to be different uh, and behave opposite. A put is in the money when the stock price uh, is uh, below the strike price, or in this case where the strike price is above the stock price. We would rather sell stock for $60 when it's trading 50 in the market. So that put would be in the money. Uh, at the money remains the same. The $50 put would be at the money when stock is trading 50, and the $45 or $40 put would be out of the money because that strike price is below the stock price. We wouldn't necessarily want to sell stock for $45 when it's trading in the market. Again, just as with calls, that's not to say that an out-of-the-money put doesn't have its uses. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the more popular strategies there is, it's called the protective put, where you uh, buy an out-of-the-money put to uh, protect against a decline in the market. So, you know, in the money, at the money, out of the money, they all have their benefits, they all have their uses, but they also all have their price. Uh, an in-the-money call or an in-the-money put is going to, to logically be more expensive than an at-the-money, which is logically going to be more expensive than an out-of-the-money. And let's go ahead and take a further look at uh, this terminology with a quick video. What's in and what's out? Well, we have three new terms. We have in the money, out of the money, and at the money. When the strike price is below the current stock price, that's in the money for a call option. The call holder has a right to buy that stock at a price which is less than it would currently cost in the stock market. For puts, when the strike price is above the current stock price, that's an in the money put. The holder of this put has a right to sell the stock at a price which is greater than would currently be received in the stock market. Let's take a quick example. If you have a stock that's trading at $70 per share and you have a strike price of $50 and you own one of these $50 calls. Remember, the stock is currently trading at $70, that's in the money by $20. Out of the money for a call is when the strike price is above the current stock price. So if you have an option, a $70 call option, when the stock is trading at $50, that option is said to be out of the money. Out of the money for a put is when the strike price is below the current stock price. So if you have an option, a $50 put option, when the stock is trading at $70, that option is said to be out of the money. A call or a put is at the money when its strike price is exactly the same as the current stock price. Let's take a quick quiz to make sure you understand the concepts. If a stock is trading at $100 and the call has a strike price of $90, how much is it in the money? If you chose $10, you're correct. Okay, I hope everyone was taking notes on that. There will be a quiz that we're going to do a little bit later where we break down a stock price uh, and the strike price as well as the premium. Then we decide is it in, at, or out of the money. And then we'll also look at the intrinsic and time value. So let's go ahead and get to that now. When it comes to uh, options, there are two components in pricing. There is the intrinsic value, that is going to be the in-the-money amount. As that video had mentioned, only in-the-money contracts have intrinsic value. And then there's the time value, which we would call the uh, extrinsic value. So the intrinsic value is the in-the-money amount. In this case, let's say a $10 bill is inherently worth $10, right? You can buy $10 worth of goods and services with it. However, if that $10 bill was signed by, say, Michael Jordan, it might be worth a little bit more, say, hypothetically, $20. Now, regardless of the signature, that bill is still worth $10 at a minimum. It is the Michael Jordan signature that makes it worth, uh, that makes it uh, be worth a little bit more. So that would be the extrinsic value. In the case of options, what makes it worth a little bit more is time, time until expiration, implied volatility, dividends, interest rates, et cetera. The thing about that time value is that it isn't constant. It decays as we approach expiration. Think about going to the grocery store. Uh, I know on the weekends when I go to the grocery store, I buy uh, about $50 worth of uh, fruits and vegetables. 
the problem with that is as soon as I leave the store, those fruits and vegetables literally begin to decay. I have a certain time frame that I need to eat these, uh, otherwise they go in the garbage. You can also you know, think about a new car, for example. The moment you drive that new car off a lot, uh, the value of that begins to decrease. And it's kind of the same thing with options. With each ticking day, that option contract is going to be worth a little bit less than it was the previous day. That concept, uh, it's known by the Greek uh, letter theta, and uh, that theta or time decay, again, it's going to be something that Ken's going to be talking about next week, or I'm sorry, next month. Uh, but the point is, is that why it's important is because at expiration, an option is only worth its intrinsic value. Uh, options are a binary event, meaning that at expiration, it's either worth something or it's worth nothing. At the money options and out of the money options, at expiration, will be worth zero. It is only in the money options that have any value, and that value is going to be that intrinsic value. So uh, again, just to recap here, we've got our option premium at the top of the pyramid. That is made up of intrinsic value, which is going to be that in the money amount. And that intrinsic value is going to be the difference between the stock price and the strike price. The extrinsic value or the time value is going to be made up of time until expiration, the implied volatility of the contract, as well as dividends and interest rates. So we can see here that, for example, in the money calls and puts, they have intrinsic value. Uh, and they may have time value on top of that. Now, the reason I say they may have time value is because the deeper we go in the money, the less extrinsic value there is in the contract. Uh, there is in the contract. Again, something that Ken will be talking about uh, in our next presentation. Um, deep in the money options will actually lose time value as a component of the total option price, and the bulk of that price will be simply made up of time value because the option is going to move almost one-to-one -one with the stock. If the stock goes up a dollar, that option may go up by, say, 95 cents in value. So those are what we would call deep in the money options. At the money options, at the money calls and puts, or even out of the money calls and puts, have no intrinsic value, and their entire option component is comprised of that time premium, that extrinsic value. And as we had mentioned, that value is going to be decreasing day by day by day. Think of, think of an hourglass, um, you know, filled with sand, and at the top you've got a buyer, and at the bottom of the hourglass you've got a seller. Well, with each ticking day, the value of that option is being taken away from the buyer and given to the seller. That's the effect of time value. So, you know, I know Mick Jagger said years ago, time is on my side. Um, certainly not if he was a buyer of options. Time value works against buyers, and it works in favor of option sellers. Let's take another look uh, at a, another video breaking down that uh, intrinsic versus time value concept. An options premium is its total market price. It's the money paid by the option buyer and received by the seller. An option premium is composed of two parts, intrinsic value, if it has any, and time value. Intrinsic value is the options in the money amount, if it has any. Time value is any premium amount in excess of intrinsic value. Therefore, only in the money calls and puts have intrinsic value. Please note that intrinsic value must be greater than or equal to zero. The premiums of at the money and out of the money calls and puts consist only of time value. Let's say we have a stock that's currently priced at $55 and we have a $50 call option on that stock priced at $8. Since the stock price is $5 above the strike price, this call is in the money by $5. It is therefore said to have $5 of intrinsic value, it's in the money amount. But the quoted premium amount is $8. The time value, in this case $3, is the premium amount in excess of the $5 intrinsic value. 
Generally, in-the-money options do not trade below intrinsic value. Okay, uh, so here is the quiz that I warned you about. Uh, I know many of you probably thought I was joking, but let's go ahead and, and kind of uh, recap what we've learned today. With We've got our stock price, our various options, calls and puts, uh, as well as the price of the option. So let's start out with a stock price of 77. We've got a $70 call trading for $10.5. Uh, and, and while you don't need to enter this into the uh, Q&A, let me ask you, 77 stock, $70 call strike, $10.5 option price. So first of all, is that contract in, at, or out of the money? We've got stock at 77, the call strike is below that share price, so we know that option is going to be in the money, and the intrinsic value is the amount by which that option is in the money. Stock is 77, the call strike is 70, so we know that the intrinsic value of that option is going to be $7. If the total premium is $10.5, then the time value of that option must be 3 dollars so when we get our intrinsic of seven, our time value of three and a half, that gives us the total premium of 10 and a half. And we know that our intrinsic value is $7 is because our call option strike is $7 below the share price. The next one, stock is trading 58 and a half. We've got a 60 strike put. So the strike is above the share price for the put and the option is trading 375. Because the put strike is above the stock price, we know that that too is in the money. The amount by which it is in the money is $1.50. That's going to be the intrinsic value. With the 375 premium, if we subtract a dollar and a half from that, that gives us our time value of two and a quarter. All right, everyone doing okay so far? Now let's look at the next one, $83 stock. $85 call trading for two and a quarter. Is that option in, at, or out of the money? Well, it's a call option, and the strike is above the stock price. So if we were to exercise that call, we would be buying stock for $85, and that stock is only trading 83 in the market. So that option is going to be out of the money. Therefore, it has no intrinsic value, and the 100% of the option price would be attributed to time value. And let's look at one more, 12 and a half stock versus a $12 and a half dollar call. The option price is a dollar and a half. This should be easy for everybody. 12 and a half stock, 12 and a half call, those are gonna be at the money. Again, at the money contracts have no intrinsic value and the entire option premium is made up of that time value. So I hope everyone did well on the quiz. If uh, you got four out of four, give yourself an A. If you got three out of four, let's see, we'll grade it on a curve, we'll give you a B on that. Uh, if you got half of them right, definitely feel free to reach out to us uh, at OIC and we'd be happy to uh, go over those again with you and just make sure that they make sense. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is the slides for this presentation are available for download. You can go to the resource window in the upper right-hand corner, download these slides, uh, and maybe you know, practice those numbers again. Uh, go over some of that information if some of it is unclear to you. And also, as with all OIC webinars that we do, this episode is being recorded. The link that you used to join us today, that uh, registration confirmation link, you can use that to access the replay at any time, and it will also be posted on our website uh, in just a, a few short days, so you can revisit uh, there. Before we get to the Q&A, I do want to stress our uh, contact information. And the reason being, again, with this influx of beginners into the world of options, uh, we want to make sure that people know what they're doing we want to make sure that they trade options responsibly, fully understanding the benefits and the risks. Options certainly do have their risks, but we want to make sure that people understand what they're getting themselves into before they risk their real-world dollars. So you can go on our website, optionseducation.org, for more educational resources. 
Certainly, if you have a question, you can shoot us an email, options at the OCC.com. We generally try to respond to emails as quickly as possible, typically within an hour or two of uh, receiving your question. You can also go on our website. We have a live chat service uh, that is open between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday on uh, trading days, so you can have live one-on-one -on -one interaction with uh, Ken, Ed, or myself and get uh, direct answers to your questions. In terms of social media, check out our YouTube channel for previous presentations that we had. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for any um, updates to future events that we uh, that the OIC is putting on. So with that, uh, I'm glad that I timed it well. I generally like to live about, leave about uh, 15 minutes or so for Q&A. Uh, Ken, I think you're on the line. Are there any uh, questions that you found that you think might be a benefit to the audience as a whole? Hi, Mark. Yeah, we've been getting a lot of really great questions, and uh, some of these well, I'll share with you. We can answer them while we're on the phone here. Um, and I just want to say, uh, along with the quiz, a lot of uh, people getting those answers right. So you're all paying attention. Give yourself all an A. Um, Excellent. So one of the questions, one of the questions that came up was uh, option pricing models. How do I access an option pricing model? Um, and I guess the the quick answer is, on our website, we actually have an options calculator that you can access free of charge if you just go to optionseducation.org. Under our menu button, there is a section uh, for um, for tools and calculators. And there is an options calculator that we do have there that you can access free of charge uh, since I believe it has it's, – it's, it's displaying the uh, Cox-Ross-Rubenstein model to take into account early exercise. But, um, you know, certainly uh, there, there's an options calculator that you can use free of charge. Uh, another really good question we got was um, – how late can I exercise my options? Just say it's a uh, expiration Friday. Uh, how long do I have until I can exercise my options? And I've heard, you know, different time frames. I've heard midnight on Saturday. I've heard midnight on Friday. So what's what's the what's the uh, answer, Mark? I'll throw that one your way. Uh, you know, Ken, as you know, this is a question that we get often here at the desk, and it's an excellent question because it doesn't necessarily have a uniform answer. Um, I'll start with this, that the exchange requires all exercise notices to be posted within 90 minutes of the close. Now, that's a little bit misleading because your broker typically and likely will have a cutoff time significantly sooner than that 90 minutes. It may be as soon as five minutes after the close of business. It may be 15, 30, or 45 minutes after the close. And the reason it's important is twofold. First and foremost, if you're going to exercise, um, and let me backtrack for a second. One of the things, one of the wonderful things about buying options, let's say, is that, and as Ed had mentioned last month, is that option buyers have the right to buy or sell stock, you know, at that strike price. That is a right that they pay for. They pay a premium when uh, purchasing that option. Now, that right doesn't cease to exist at 3 p.m. Chicago time. Uh, or 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. That right exists until your broker's cutoff time. If your broker's cutoff time is five minutes after the close of business, that's when your right ends. If your broker's cutoff time is 30 minutes after the close of business, that's when that right ends. And the reason it's important is because of any after-hours activity. Now, options don't trade after hours. So at 3 o'clock Chicago time, the bell rings, equities cease trading. 3.15, uh, the bell rings, uh, most of the indices cease trading. But if there is any after hours information, uh, an earnings event, um, a trading halt, or, um, you know, whatever it may be, Typically, it's a you know, release of earnings, but if there's an after-hours event that occurs within that window that you have, 
you may choose as an option buyer to exercise an out-of-the-money contract, or you may choose as the option buyer not to exercise your in-the-money contract. And what that means to sellers uh, is that you may still be at risk of any market movements, and by market I mean stock market movements, 15 minutes after the close of business or 30 minutes after the close of business. And the problem is, is you, you know, now that the market is closed, you're not going to be able to react to an assignment notice. So if your contract finishes just out of the money you and there is some aftermarket movement, you certainly could be at risk for an unexpected assignment and uh, there's nothing that you can do about it. Uh, so it's it's very, very important that all buyers and sellers are intimately familiar with their trading firm's cutoff times in terms of exercise and what their policies and procedures are uh, for exercising in the money, at the money, or out of the money contracts, as well as what the assignment procedure is to receive those notices. Very, very good question. Yeah, that's 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 an and that's an excellent answer, Mark. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize they think well you know i'm short some options my options expired uh stock closed at 100 and i'm short the 105 calls um i'm just going to keep all that premium well nine times out of ten that's most likely going to happen but you know news does happen after the close and if somebody you know if stock came, you know came out with some good news and stock was trading 110 in the post market somebody might choose to exercise that call on you and you would wake up on monday morning short 100 shares of stock if you were short a call. So um, there is right. there are those risks, and people need to be aware of that. Right. I think that's, that's yeah. yeah, and there's something, Ken, as Ken is, is you certainly remember, there's something that we used to say on the trading floor, when in doubt, close them out. And, and to, the, to, to our listeners, you know, really what it's saying is if you don't know whether or not you're going to be assigned, if you're not 100% sure, whether or not you're going to be assigned, or if you don't want to be assigned, simply close out your contract. There's there's plenty of times where if you sell your, uh, just hypothetically, you sell an option for a dollar, it seems that it's going to expire worthless. Why not spend a couple pennies at the close of business, or I should say prior to the close of business, you know, spend a couple pennies or spend a nickel to close out that contract and be absolutely certain that you will not be assigned. That we we've often talked to people that are penny, um, you know, that that try to save pennies at the expense of dollars. As Ken had mentioned, it may have only costed, uh, you know, it only may have cost a, a nickel or so to close that 105 strike call out to buy it back to close when stocks trading 100. And by doing so, all risk is off the table. Instead. You wake up Monday morning, you find out that you just sold 100 shares at 105, and it's now trading 110 in the market. So you, you, instead of spending the nickel, you ended up losing $500. So, um, you know, we do often see people uh, trying to save pennies at the risk of dollars. Again, when in doubt, close them out. Okay, another question we got from uh, a listener does time value erode over the weekends, market holidays, et cetera? Um, I would yeah, answer abso yes. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I mean, even yeah, though the trading. The... Right. Go ahead, Ken. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You, 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 were, you were in the middle of the thought. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, even though the market sleeps, um, uh, option values do not meaning that the the time value, that theta amount of uh, whatever it may be, $0.03, cents, $0.10, cents, $0.20, cents, you know, whatever that number is, is a, a daily factor. Um, I do remember, you know, down in the trading pit that uh, some traders would actually, uh, what they would call roll their sheets or take their sheets out uh, a day or two. And basically that means is, is is simulate my position, simulate my portfolio that I have uh, on Friday, simulate it to reflect what it would look like on Monday by taking out those two days of theta uh, that I'm going to lose. I'm going to be losing a, a value of, um, of my position, value on that trade each and every day, including market holidays, including Saturdays, including Sundays. So what traders would actually do is they would simulate 
what their position would look like on Monday, uh, taking out that weekend, and they can see on Friday what adjustments they would need to make in order to account for that loss. So, yes, the, the, the market may sleep, but the value never does. Right. And just this, you know, when I was a trader for many years, just to Mark's point, I would do the exact same thing. We'd be on a trading floor Friday afternoon at, at uh, noon, and I'm not valuing options on my sheets Friday. I'm really valuing them on Monday because I don't want to overvalue them. I'm taking into that weekend's decay. So, yes, that, that d decay does get somewhat priced, um, but uh, and those options will decay over the weekend. But uh, but but just know that personally, I just I can tell you from personal experience as a trader, we would do the exact same thing. We would run our 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 formula, our models three days ahead to account for that decay. Um, let's see another question that we received is uh, we had a listener who was short a call, and the stock ran considerably, and now her her short call was considerably in the money but it had a substantial amount of time premium left in it. And this person was wondering why they didn't get exercised, why their call wasn't exercised early. So what do you think, Mark? Okay. Yeah, So, and, and that's, a, again, another excellent question. One of the things about exercise, and, and it's a difference, um, and I'm sure Ken will touch on this point uh, uh, on his uh, presentation when he talks about deltas. There's a difference between probability of being in the money or out of the money, as the case may be, and profitability. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you exercise your contract, and let's use a hypothetical example of $50 uh, stock and we've got a $45 call, and let's say that $45 call is trading for $5.50, okay? So try to picture that in your head. $50 stock, $45 call, premium $5.50. If I exercise my contract early, I am going to pay my strike price times 100, so I'm going to pay $4,500, and I'm going to take delivery of 100 shares of stock currently trading at $50. So I'm going to pay $4,500 to receive $5,000 worth of stock. So theoretically, I could turn around and sell that stock at 50, and I've made myself a $500 profit, not including what I paid for the option to begin with. So that's the exercise. When you exercise the contract, you're simply paying your strike price times 100. You're basically buying shares at your strike price. Now, conversely, if I were to uh, sell that call in the market where it's trading $5.50, I could simply turn around and sell to close and collect five and a half dollars per contract uh, multiplied by the $100 multiplier. So I'm collecting $550 by closing out my contract rather than exercising it. If I exercise, I theoretically make 500 bucks on the stock. If I turn around and sell to close, I'm making $550. Again, that's um, you know, uh, not taking into account the premium that I paid to begin with. But to answer um, to answer the question, why didn't I get assigned even though my short call was in the money? The, the reason being is when you exercise, you lose any of that extrinsic value. You lose any of that time value in the contract. If you simply turn around and sell to close, you're gaining that time value. So that likely was the difference. Certainly if, if you had... Uh, some time until expiration. The reason that the contract was not exercised early was simply that if the call buyer were to exercise, they would lose out on any time value in that option. And I would agree, Mark. I would I would say that, and, and I know you touched upon it during the presentation, for somebody to exercise their option, whether it's a call or put early, they, there has to be an economic incentive to do so. And by exercising early in the case of a call or a put, you're foregoing any time premium left in that option. So um, the only reason somebody would most likely exercise a call early is for a dividend. If the time premium in the option was uh, less than the amount of the dividend, maybe the time premium in the option was 10 cents and the dividend would, stock was going ex dividend tomorrow for 50 cents, that call might be a candidate to be exercised early for the dividend. Um, a put, 
on the other hand, might get exercised early for short interest. If you, if you exercise your put, you're going to be selling stock. And if you sell stock short, you get paid short interest on that stock as long as it's not hard to borrow. Um, and if that interest is more than the time premium left in that option, it might be a candidate to be exercised early. These days with interest rates being practically zero, you don't see a lot of puts getting exercised early, but just know that that's, uh, that's always a possibility. Calls and puts can be exercised early, but there has to be an economic incentive for somebody to do that in the first place. Um, right. We used so to I think say, to, yeah. we used to say oh. that, you know, as a call buyer, a, a call buyer will uh, exercise their contract when it is actually they within American style uh, expiry, they can exercise at any time and for any reason. And typically, we would say that reason is, as Ken had mentioned, it needs to be economically advantageous to that buyer. Um, but again, that uh, you know that doesn't that doesn't mean that uh, somebody may not exercise that contract early for whatever reason. Um, and as a option seller, it's really irrelevant as to whether what that reason is for the buyer, because once you get assigned. You're assigned. You need to live up to that assignment. You need to deliver shares, uh, you know, that same day, uh, and, and it's too late to manage the position at that time. So definitely, you know, and, and again, it kind of goes back to the when in doubt, close them out. Uh, certainly, if you are around the money, if you've got a, a near at the money option, it might make better sense to simply just take it off the books, uh, close the contract out, and uh, therefore you have no more risk. Um, and as Ken was about to mention, it looks like we're out of time. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Again, I cannot stress enough, especially I see that there's a, a number of first-time joiners here to uh, our, our webinars. I can only assume that means that possibly you're uh, new to options. Uh, if that's the case, definitely make use of our services. Uh, shoot us an email. Uh, join us on chat for a uh, one-to-one -one interaction. We want to make sure that you fully understand what it is you're doing, fully understand the benefits and risks of trading options responsibly. Uh, they are a wonderful, as our CEO put it on a recent podcast, a wonderful method of risk transfer. Uh, we uh, Options can potentially generate income for you. They can potentially mitigate risk. They can potentially uh, afford you the opportunity to buy stock below current share prices. Um, they're an incredibly flexible tool, but just like any other investment, they are not without their risks. So it's absolutely uh, inherent and incumbent upon the investor to understand those risks prior to engaging in any option trading. And that's where OIC comes in. We want to make sure that you fully understand what you're getting yourselves into. So definitely make use of our services. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to join us uh, on our next event when Ken is going to be talking about those Greeks a little bit more, Delta, Theta, Gamma, Vega, and Rho. Um, in the meantime, reach out to us, options at theocc.com. Uh, chat with us on our website, optionseducation.org. Please, everybody, be safe, be healthy, and we'll see you very, very soon. Have a great day.